My wife ever saw me, she said, shame, an old man like you. <laughs> Master ceremonies. Mr. Biles, our president. Special invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen all. Sagittarian. When I received my invitation to attend this seminar, I was asked to do two things. Firstly, as chairman of SAGICOR, I was asked to extend a hearty welcome to one and all. And I take this opportunity on behalf of the board to do so, and in particular, to extend a very hearty welcome to our overseas guests and our special guests. We're delighted to have you join us at this seminar. The second thing I was asked to do was to talk about myself. <laughs> well, I was told that I had 30 minutes. That's what Marcia told me. I told her that I don't know how she could, be ex how she could expect me to cover 80 years 60 of which have all, for practical purposes, been in the insurance business. I need a whole book. I need the whole day. <laughs> but I'll do my best so that I'll share with you as best I can just some of the highlights of my life. Master said to me, Danny, the truth of the matter is that a lot of these people don't know your roots. They don't know that you started life just like us. They don't know your, your circumstances. And I think it would be a good idea for you to share it with them. So as I said, I will share a few highlights in the time allotted to me. If I go over the time, I shall totally ignore these things I have down here. <laughs> but you know, to put us, to keep us in the mood that we obviously are in, I must tell you that I have the experience where, because a lot of my friends, those who are still alive, are retired, a lot of them keep sending me email, <clears throat> all kind of rude jokes, and some, some things you can share in mixed company, but most of them you can't. And, you know, I got one this week that I thought I would share with you because I thought it was quite funny. It's, it's told about it's headed what, when grandma goes to court. Lawyers should never ask a Mississippi grandma a question if they aren't prepared for the answer. In a trial in a small southern city in the Mississippi, Mississippi area, prosecuting attorney called his first witness a grandmotherly, elderly woman to the stand. He approached her and asked her, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, why, yes, I know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a boy. And frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. <laughs> you lie, you cheat on your wife, and you manipulate people and talk about them behind their backs. You think you're a big shot when you haven't the brains to realize you'll never amount to anything more than a two-bit paper pusher. Yeah, I know you. The lawyer was stunned. Not knowing what else to do, he pointed across the room and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? She replied again, why, yes, I do. 
I've known Mr. Bile since he was a youngster. <coughs> I couldn't miss that one. The real name is Bradley. He's lazy, bigoted, and has a drinking problem. He can't build a normal relationship with anyone. And his law practice is one of the worst in the entire state. Not to mention, he cheated on his wife with three different women. One of them was your wife. I know him. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, the defense attorney nearly died. Then the judge quietly asked both counselors to approach the bench. And in a very quiet voice, he said to them, if either of you idiots ask her if she knows me, I'll send you both to the electric chair. Actually, you know, if you'd prefer it, I have about 30 more here. <laughs> well, as I said, Marcia gave me instruction. And so I will start by telling you who I am. I was born on the 3rd of July, 1934, to working class parents. My father had to leave school at age 13, give up his scholarship at Woolmers, because his father died. And his 15-year-old sister and himself, 13, had to go out and work. He was a rapper at Nathan's to support the other two younger children. I was fortunate to have attended Jamaica College. from 1946 until 1952. The fact of the matter is that in those days, less than 10,000 of us got the benefit of a secondary education in this country. It was only possible because of the enormous sacrifices made by my parents. My mother did dressmaking, and she would work into all hours of the night in order to be able to pay my school fees, because in those days, you had to pay. Now, I know I don't have the time for all the details, but just suffice for us to say that it was a huge sacrifice. At JC, at age 16, I learned my first really important lesson in life. In fact, around that time, I learned really three lessons in one. The first thing was decide where you want to go in life. Put another way, establish clearly in your mind what you want to achieve. I'm not ashamed to tell you that because I was one of the less fortunate and I had the majority of the boys around me were much better off, it gave me a desire to have things and it spurred in me the desire to be financially independent. So much so that at age 12, I started my own business, selling cigarettes in the neighborhood. <laughs> but it was good enough that at 17, I could buy my own car with my cigarette profits and drive to school. The second thing I learned was that if you work hard enough, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. As I said, I learned this at, when I was 12 years old and started my first business, and I learned it again in fifth form. The third thing I learned was that 
the thrill of success is sweet. I'll tell you what happened. In third and fourth form, the hormones were starting to develop, and I found girls very attractive. In fact, I still find them very attractive. You should have felt the electricity between Pans and me a while ago. And so I slacked in third and fourth form. And then when fifth form came along, I said, you know, I'm going to really buckle down. And I got my parents to send me to boarding school. And I spent the entire year studying. And I really worked hard and caught up. And there were only five of us who got what was called in those, in those days grade one. And I'm proud to tell you, I was one of the five. I have never felt a euphoria like that, like I felt the day it was announced in the lunchroom, the boys who had got great, well, had passed the exam. I felt like I was walking on a cloud. I tell my wife, but don't repeat it, because the only time I felt that like was when I married her, otherwise. <laughs> but um, I don't tell her about the first one. I really started selling insurance at about age 16. My brother-in-law, my sister and my brother-in-law lived with us, and he was selling for North American Life. He started bringing home the books. I started reading them. I also saw another opportunity to make some money. So I started introducing him to the boys who were leaving school because I needed the spotter's fee he was paying me. Well... When I'd left school, I went on and did sixth form. When I left school, I was told I had to have a profession. But the fact was, it's not like today, my friend. There was no university around. UW, I had just started. There was no other university in Jamaica. And it was only doing medicine at the time for 15 or 20 people. I would have had to go abroad, but there was no money to send me abroad. And you'd have to try and arrange with somebody to give a scholarship. So I found the first lesson in networking. Never sell networking short here. For a friend of mine, Desmond Mayer, that's the father of Greg Mayer, um, was a very good friend. In fact, we were inseparable. And his father had an accounting firm, and so he got me a job. Left school Friday, turned out to work the Monday. And I tried accounting for six weeks. Well, I used to fall asleep. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not my kind of thing. And then another friend of mine, Mr. Bloomfield, Sit Bloomfield, father of John Bloomfield, the conservator, who was another good friend of mine. He's, they were setting up the anhydrous alcohol plant at Caymanus Estate. And because I'd done chemistry and so on, <coughs> He said he got me a position there. Well, um, again, it was with the promise that I'd get a scholarship to Guelph University to do chemical engineering. But the truth was, insurance had started to get into my blood. I don't know if it was the commissions or what, but insurance was getting into my blood. Because whilst I was at Caymanus, I was still doing part-time sales. Well, when you're working in the day, and then you're doing a night shift, all kind of things can happen. Well, the truth was, I fell asleep on the job one night. And I nearly blew up the entire anhydrous alcohol plant. <laughs> and so Mr. Hendel suggested it would probably be in my best interest to resign. <laughs> so I decided I would go into the insurance business first, full time. My first problem, however, was I was only 18 years and nine months old. I couldn't get a contract because I could not get bonded under age 21. So I sold as a spotter for my brother-in-law for three months and did very well. During that time, I was friendly with the girl who's now my wife, still my wife. So it wasn't too long before that we got married. 
we just couldn't bear the thought of not getting together. So we got married. Her father was the manager of Dominion Life Insurance Company. And he, when I went to visit at night, he'd be there teaching me about insurance. I wouldn't give me a chance at all. <laughs> but he... He knew how well I was doing on this part-time thing. And he got Dominion Life to offer me a contract. So he offered to guarantee the bond. Well, North American Life was told, looks like I have to go to Dominion. And of course, you know what happens when you put people under pressure. A telegram, in those days it was Telegram. It didn't have no phone, no hi-fi and all them things. A Telegram came back. There's nothing Dominion Life can do that we can't do. And so with the Guarantee of my father, back in my bond, I got a contract. On the 3rd of July, 1953, which was backdated to the 1st of April, and all the policies I had sold as a part-time, but through my brother-in-law, was transferred to my contract. And I still have that contract. Well, I did well. I was full-time for four years. The leading agent... I led because I had a story to tell. I did well from day one because I wasn't afraid to sell. I wasn't afraid to sell service and sell again. I wasn't afraid to tell the motivational stories that I'd read in books or better still, the experience that I, my father had had where he had been a bright boy, a scholarship boy, had to leave school at 13 because of the death of his father. I had the personal experience very early in my career of a fellow named Gladstone Murphy, age 26, wife, three children, half-finished house, dying from a massive heart attack early in my career, within the first couple of years. Lola Murphy, some of you will remember, was his sister-in-law. I saw that family suffer because of the lack of insurance. He had actually applied for insurance and not paid the premium at the time of application. And he died before the policy was issued. If he had paid the premium, that house would have been finished. I wasn't afraid to tell my story. And I wasn't afraid to sell. I went on and became a supervisor, assistant manager, after selling full-time for four years, for three years. I developed a unit of 20 agents during that time, and I still was first or second in the branch. Early in the game, I realized the need for knowledge. You see, in the days when I became an agent, you got a rate book, application form, and an R&R &R book, which you are told to sit down and read, and you are to go out and sell. So that was the extent of the training you got. Well, I realized that was standing my passion and my emotion for the business, that I needed to know more. And early in the game, I realized the need for knowledge. And so during the same time, when I was selling full-time, training agents full-time, I did my CLU. And on the 7th of August, 58, I got my CLU, an extension thing, through the University of Toronto. 7th of August, 1958, the certificate is dated. Oliver Jones and I studied together for it. So we had all of this going on. At the same time, I was, got married, and by this time, I must have had three or four children. <laughs> um, it took us a while before we decided, found out what was causing it. Eventually, after six, we found out and stopped. <laughs> I was appointed country manager for Jamaica on the 1st of June, 1960, when I was, you know, leaving it with me. Not so much that I thirsty, you know, but 
a little tickled in the throat. I was appointed country manager on the 1st of June when I, was, I wasn't quite 26. And over the next 10 years, because as you know, I don't have much time, we built the biggest branch for Nalco worldwide. We had over 100 agents. My team of managers and I did this for 10 years and developed an outstanding reputation in the country. We were known as the pace setters. We all drove big cars. We all were buying houses. We all were doing well. Step back a little bit. Independence had come to us in 1962. And a new breeze of nationalism had started blowing in Jamaica. Bank of Nova Scotia, for example, had Jamaicanized and sold 20% of the company on the local market. I tried to get North American Life to do the same. Although we were successful, in fact, I was probably the highest earner in the country as a person earning a, an income at that time. When I told my father I was going to form Life of Jamaica, he yeah, said, boy, you're mad. He said, look what you're earning. You're going to chuck that away? But the truth is, my team and I, something was missing. Yes, as I say, we had the comfort, but we wanted more for our country. There were 17 branches of insurance companies in Jamaica, but we did nothing for ourselves. Even the urine specimens were sent to Toronto to be tested. We didn't produce even an envelope for ourselves, but we had this, per this passion. We wanted to build an industry. We wanted to create jobs. We wanted to create professions. We wanted to be involved in the investment of Jamaican funds. The funds were actually being sent abroad to Canada. We get the odd mortgage, but they weren't 10% invested in Jamaica. We wanted to have our own board of directors making decisions for us. We wanted to be part of the development of our new nation. As I said, I tried to get Nalco to do the BNS type of thing, 5149, but they wouldn't do it. And so I decided at the corner of Duke Street, talking to my old buddy Douglas Fletcher, who had involved me in the formation of um, Citizens Bank, I said, Douglas, I'm going to form a local company. Well, you know, at that time, the idea of forming a local company was quite an undertaking. Well, I sold, the first people I had to sell were my associates because all of them were big earners and we're saying to them, look, we're going to take a risk. And because we had worked together and we believed in each other, I was able to sell my associates. And again, to cut a long story short, after two years of planning and work, Jamaica knew we had arrived on the 1st of June, 1970. On the 1st of June, 1970, 2,500 Jamaicans put up the money to form this company. It was formed with 2.5 million Jamaican dollars. I was the largest shareholder with 4%. <laughs> Every member of staff had shares. You see, they'd all got back the pension refund because they, they were all made redundant and got the pension money. And all of that money went in the forming life of Jamaica. On the first day of June 1970, we sold more insurance than we had sold in any month before. In fact, we did such a great sales job that we sold too much insurance for the capital base we had developed. You see, as you know, the insurance business requires significant capital. In those days, you didn't have no negative reserves. And we were just selling ourselves into bankruptcy. In two years, we were heading for bankruptcy. Well, we had developed a model office, and it used to take us a whole night to run a model, what you run now in about five seconds. And it showed us where we were going into total grief. And so I had to go to the staff and tell them that, look, we're heading for bankruptcy unless we deal with this problem. And again, to cut a long story short, my staff, the entire staff, agreed to move into an austerity program, took a 10% cut in salaries, 
and agreed to have it frozen like that for two years. You know, and we all agreed that we would really try and go through a serious austerity program. You know, I even used to make them take the paper clips out of the waste baskets. But we saved money. But in addition to that, we needed aged portfolios. We needed something that would be kicking off surpluses and to support our sales machine. I was, we, in fact, we had to stop recruiting for a couple of years because of the volume of sales we were doing. We also had a problem. We needed to acquire some of the aged portfolios that existed in Jamaica. But the superintendent, the Canadian companies had a rule. They'd never transfer to anything other than a Canadian company in the absence of legislation forcing them to do it. And we had no such legislation. Well, again, to, I convinced the superintendent in Canada that he could deal with us. I treated him like he was chairman of the board. I went to see him every two months and told him everything we were doing and why it was necessary because I had a few companies um, Maritime and one or two others that were interested in having their business transferred to us. Well, we got, I convinced him and he agreed. And over time, we were able to acquire those portfolios without any cash. We did it by issuing 20 year preference shares. They transferred the liabilities, they transferred the appropriate assets. We gave them preference shares for 20 years so that they could get some of the profits and we got most of the surpluses. We took over Maritime Life, Empire Life, North American, Confed, American, and I think there was one or two more, but I couldn't remember. As a result of the acquisitions and the austerity, we grew and did well. All through the 70s and 80s, we did well. We grew from strength to strength. We developed professionals in all eras. We helped Jamaica grow and develop. We developed products suited to the Jamaican market. We built apartment buildings which we sold to the middle class in this country. We built shopping centers, the Springs, New Kingston, Spanish Town, Bow Bay. We built commercial complexes, Norman, Man Norman Road, Bow Bay Freeport. We built office buildings, the whole western section of New Kingston. We innovated. We created the worker mortgages. The first company to offer a 90% mortgage in Jamaica was Life of Jamaica. We supported government paper. And on top of it all, we were a good corporate citizen. We were involved in things that made a difference and that helped Jamaicans at all levels. In the early 1990s, we expanded overseas, acquired the manufacturer's life portfolio in Bermuda, Bahamas, Cayman, Puerto Rico. Barbados <clears throat> wouldn't let us in. We started to build some good subsidiaries. We even did a public issue in the Bahamas and sold 49% to the Bahamians because they too were very nationalistic. Then came the crash of the 90s. The Jamaican economy, frankly, had not been managed well for a period of time. There'd been far too much print on the money, high inflation, ridiculous interest rates, tremendous real estate bubble, and a runaway stock market. When all that came crashing down, we found ourselves in quite a bit of problem. We had very, we had been very prudent in our investments. We even had massive investment reserves because we expected it to come. We had, I think it was one or two billion dollars in, in uh, investment reserves in anticipation. But we expected a meltdown. Our assets dropped in value, but our liabilities remained much the same. And so we had to get capital from the government which, as you know, they subsequently sold to a consortium of Barbadian companies. Well, you all know what happened since the late 90s. We have once again gone from strength to strength once we got the capital, and we are confident to the, in the future, even after, not we stand, even after we're standing our NDX, our JDX, and the SDX, which has cost us over four billion, we've been able So my friends, I hope that from these few remarks, you understand that it has not been a bed of roses for all these 43 years. 60 of my 79 plus years, or the 43 years of Sajikor, Life of Jamaica. 
But I do hope you all see that if you know where you are going, and if you are willing to pay the price, then success is assured. In closing, I want to say to all of you salespeople, now called advisors, study. Know your product. If necessary, use the experiences of others to find out what your product can really do for people. And in this way, bring your product to life. Make it breathe. Remember, we do not sell an inanimate piece of paper. We sell a future. We sell security. We sell peace of mind. We sell food, freedom from want, fear, and worry. We sell education. We sell a title to a home. Indeed, we even sell Christmas toys. And above all, we sell love of our family. So my friends, I repeat, study and understand your product. Believe in it. Become excited about it. Because only by so doing will you be able at the right time to pour your heart into a sale and close it. As I mentioned excitement, I must mention the excitement you must feel about your job. For this does help to keep us focused and motivated. And I repeat, I'm talking about the job of selling, serving and selling again. I know that we have to counsel our clients on their financial affairs, but believe you me, the most important thing is you are a salesman. If you're too good to be a salesperson, if the job of sales bores you, it is impossible for you to do a good job. However, if you enjoy it, if you can become enthusiastic about it, if you'd rather sell and do any other work in the world, if you can sell with a missionary zeal, you will succeed. Do you know one successful professional who is not excited about his profession? My friends, there's so much more to being successful. But above all else, it takes guts courage and determination. And to this end, I would close my remarks, finally, by reminding you of James J. Corbett's approach to every single bout in his boxing career. And I quote, fight one more round. When your feet are so tired that you have to shuffle to the center of the ring, fight one more round. When your arms are so tired that you can hardly lift your hands to come on guard, fight one more round. When your nose is bleeding and your eyes are closing and you're so tired that you wish your opponent would crack you on the jaw and put you to sleep, fight one more round. Remember that the man who always fights one more round is never weak. Thank you.